when we declare and know that everything is going our way. And so we give thanks. And to, to, to help us to get there, I'd like to invite our pastor, assistant pastor, supportive pastor, Reverend Michael Record, playwright, poet, teacher, practitioner, minister, to bring to you the message this morning. Please welcome Reverend Michael Record. Good morning, friends. I was mentioning to Sandy, some of you might not have heard, that she didn't finish the title of the hymn we just sang. Oh, what a beautiful morning adapted by Sandra Cooper. Finish, finish the title. It's, it's a real nice adaptation. Folks, I greet you here worshiping in the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. And also I greet those listening to me online. Peace, prosperity, health, joy, and love to you all. Those are the things that we want in life, and we search ceaselessly for them. Some people, though, are searching outside on themselves for these blessings, when really they should be looking where? Inside, within. But knowing where to look within is one thing. We also need to know how to look. And often, we need to be able to recognize the thing that we are looking for. And those three things, those three processes, I'll be addressing in this talk. This program will be my main reference. You see, sometimes we have the thing we want and don't know we do. You've all heard stories of couples breaking up, separating, and then wanting to get back together again because they realize that the partner that they had was really the best one for them. Happens all the time. And there is the famous story of the man who unknowingly sold his field of diamonds, thinking it was just a field of rocks and dirt. And he went off into the world, leaving his field of diamonds to go and search for his fortune. Sometimes you already have the treasure that you want, but you don't realize it. Let me, let me put that more accurately. Not sometimes. We all have a treasure inside. And that treasure is the, is the source of all our good, God. But again, we need to know how to align ourselves with that source so that it gives us all our desires. Which brings me to this morning's topic, creativity. Specifically, the creative process in the individual. Some of you know that that is the title of a book by Thomas Troward. Perhaps, some people say, it is his masterpiece. And I was led to that topic, the creative process in the individual, because of the many references to creativity that I noticed last week in this, in this Sunday service program. I'd like us to look at it together. And I hope that you will see it as your field of diamonds. Most of us just drop it on the chair as we leave, when really and truly, many of the programs, and especially this one, has a lot of good for us, a lot of inspiration. And this one is chock full, as I say, with advice about creativity and explanations about what creativity is. The first mention of creativity comes in the abundance treatment. This is on page two. 
by Dr. Elmer Lumsden, who most of you probably know, founded this church. She explains the creation process thus. It's uh, that the top paragraph on the right. By the power of my belief, coupled with my purposeful, fearless actions, and my deep rapport with God, my future is created and my abundance made manifest. Three things, she says, are necessary for creativity, for manifestation. Strong belief, purposeful action, and unification with God. Those three things are echoed in the responsive reading which we just went through, most of which, especially paragraphs two to 10, this is on page four, if you'd like to follow along with me. Those paragraphs especially, two to 10, speak to creativity. The second sentence is a statement that we often hear attributed to national hero, Marcus Messiah Garvey, and of course, today's Hero's Sunday, so it's appropriate that we start off with, with a quotation by him. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. So what he's saying is creating something begins with our imagination. Of course, we can imagine all sorts of things having as much money, perhaps, as Bill Gates. We can imagine that, can't we? And that makes us feel good. We can imagine being as famous as Oprah. Who hasn't heard of Oprah? Or having the ab athletic ability of Usain Bolt, who, by the way, is now a footballer, scored two goals in a match last week. He's on his way, perhaps another Pele in the making. That boy, is, that guy's really, really very talented. But Garvey says, the imagination needs to be twinned with belief. Imagination twinned with belief, he says. And this reminds us of Jesus' saying, it is done unto you as you believe. So both Garvey and Jesus are saying that faith is crucial to creating what you want in life. Faith, belief, strong belief. Please remember that. And don't complain that you don't get what you want in life if you don't know that you can have it. That's what faith really is, knowing, not just idly, wishing and hoping. I want you to try this exercise right now. Remember, call to mind something that you have wanted for some time and you haven't yet gotten. Think about it. Something you really want hasn't come about yet. Now, ask yourself if you know that you can have that thing. Ask yourself, do I really know that I can have it, not just want it? If the answer isn't yes, I know, then that may be why you haven't gotten it yet. You've got to get yourself into the state of knowing that what it, what it is that you want, you can get. What you can conceive, you can achieve. Something that I personally have wanted for Jamaica for at least 16 years, perhaps more, for, is for everyone in the island to have access to our teaching, religious science. Now, that desire of mine is now being fulfilled. We now have science of mind classes and religious in, science information, generally speaking, online and accessible to all Jamaica, and indeed accessible to the world. 16 years ago when I first thought about it, it was not online, now it is. Additionally, for the past six years, 
Templar black ministers and the practitioner have been going into two of our prisons and indirectly spreading our truth with the course, change your thinking, change your life. No, we don't directly teach sense of mind. Reverend John deliberately didn't ask the authorities permission to teach a religious course. There are many other denominations uh, that are teaching in prison already. We went uh, sort of indirectly teaching them how if they change their thinking, their lives will change. And there's more on that course. Reverend Ann and I have recently taken the course into a school at the YWCA. The first cohort will graduate in two weeks. And we have another set of students at the Y waiting. So we'll have two graduations before Christmas. Now, notice it took 13 weeks for the first prison cohort to graduate. But in that same 13 weeks, we'll have two graduations at the Y. The secret, of course, is that we have two classes a week at the Y, not one. Now, here's the thing. Remember, I wanted to spread throughout Jamaica. If the school program is successful, and there's every indication that it is successful, the kids really love Reverend Anne and myself, then if it's successful there, it can be successful in all schools. And there are schools, as you know, right throughout the island. Imagine if there was a sense of mind group in every one of those schools. Just imagine that, our teaching throughout the island. That's what I want, and Reverend John, and all of us practitioners. But wait, there is more. This is where you come in. And this is breaking news. I'm not sure if Reverend John should be here. Um, we want to start the island-wide push with some teacher training right here in this center. Any volunteers? <laughs> ah, had made that connection, Reverend John. Excellente. Public speaking course already very popular. Public demands that we have it on a continuing basis. And we, we want teachers to go out into the island. There we go. We have our field of diamonds, and I never even know it. So you'll hear more about this in coming months. As we speak, Reverend John is compiling the textbook for the, the program to spread um, in schools and perhaps community groups, etc. We want sense of mind to be accessible in every nook and cranny of this island, we know that it is very, very good for us and by extension for Jamaica. I'm not absolutely sure that I should have announced it yet. Anyway, the cat's out of the bag, the horse has gone through the gate, the arrow has left the bow, and we all know what we have in mind for you. Let's get back to responsive reading. A couple of paragraphs later, there's an explanation about how the thing you want becomes manifest. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee." Unquote. You decree what you want into existence through the power of your word. And when you do it with faith, Voila, there it is. The next three paragraphs after that tells us the conditions under which the creative process uh, proceeds. It explains that thoughts are actual things. Thoughts are things. It is a, a form of matter, if you wish, a very refined form, perhaps like a vibration. And thought, we see it here, thought lays, holds of, lays hold of causation. So operating through the law of cause and effect, 
which is the primary law of the universe, the cause and effect, your thought forms real substance. Now that could be a little bit misleading, but the next sentence explains how things manifest. It's through the law of attraction. Everyone automatically attracts to him or herself just what he or she is. So, you want a certain type of person in your life? You have got to be that type of person. You, if you want a certain condition in your life, you have got to have that condition inside yourself. Remember, we all agreed when I started this talk that creation begins from the inside. Then the next paragraph expands on the faith concept, saying that you need to believe that there is a creative power which knows how to create. Yes, there is that creative power, um, and it can create, we must believe that. The third paragraph is a, a little poetic, um, and I'm not going to bother to unpack the, poet, the poetry. Um, it says, <coughs> excuse me, using metaphor, it says that your soul should live in the light of the spirit and look up to that light, a bit like looking up to the sun. And the more you do that, the more creative um, you will be. Now, the next paragraph I find very interesting. That's the last paragraph on page four. It tells us that the infinitely creative, infinitely powerful spirit can't do its work without us. Now, that's interesting. That should make our hell swell, eh? Except that that is just another way of reminding us that the manifest universe, which includes us, is the body of God. And we then remember that a body is useless without life and that our life is God. So we depend on each other. God depends on us, its hands, its body, and we depend on God, the life, the motivating force. So together, God and ourselves, we are one physically and spiritually. The last of the 10 paragraphs I'm analyzing quotes the Bible passage about getting your priorities straight. This is on page five, the second paragraph. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and you'll get all you want. And the previous uh, paragraphs gave us a pretty good idea of what it means to seek the kingdom of God. So that's what we should do. Um, seek it first, and everything else will be added unto to us. Now we can turn to page seven, and the two articles there tell us how to create prosperity. The focus here is on prosperity. Both repeat the principles that we have already encountered. The words of wisdom, the paragraph at the top, refers to the law of attraction. I quote, sit and realize you are the center of divine attraction. And it also re refers to having faith. Trust completely in it, and it will bring its good, and it bring, bring your good to you. And you get that same message in the article below that, in the Ernest Holmes and Alberta Smith advice column. But there's an interesting addition, a reminder that the universe has numerous channels along which it can funnel our good. And it's not for us to dictate which channel the universe is to use. What we should do, and I quote, open wide every door and window of your mind. The paragraph tells us metaphorically, open up all your mind to all the channels possible and the universe will find the best and the easiest way 
to channel your good to you. Then, still going through, on the inside back cover, Dr. Holmes has what I believe is a really powerful, logical argument about creativity. And you can't reasonably contradict any of the simply expressed but truly profound statements. For example, as you look around at the greatness and beauty of the universe, you have to admit that first, first sentence there. There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are. You've got to admit that as you look around. There is this power. We didn't create the flowers, etc. So there is this power which creates um, it, they, these things, and they are outside of us. Of course, we're connecting. And you can see and hear and touch the evidence of that greatness. And you know that much of it, much of that greatness that you see around us, the ships, the planes, the highways, the vehicles, etc., started off with a thought inside. So thought is creative. And it follows, Dr. Holmes continues, it follows that if any thought is creative, then all thought is creative. It's just logical. That conclusion, though, may be a little frightening, that all thought is creative. Because we know that many of our thoughts are negative, especially when we're in traffic and we get cut off by a, 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 a taxi driver, yes. I was also thinking about those jail, the Juta buses. Um, so we have these negative thoughts about ourselves sometimes. We put ourselves down too often and we have these negative thoughts about others. So if those thoughts are creative too, hmm, we might be attracting negative things to us. And you should fear that negative things will flow from negative thoughts. That's, that's the law. But then there is comfort to be drawn from Dr. Holmes's penultimate statement. Change the idea of the thing, and you'll change the thing. So if you do have a negative thought, just change it around. You have control of your thoughts. And when you change the idea of the thing, then what is to manifest will be positive. I want to unpack that statement a little bit for its implication. Change the, your, the idea of a thing and you'll change the, the thing. It brings to mind two very common maxims of science of mind. The first we have encountered before, change your thinking, change your life. And the second one, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Now, in one sense, those two statements mean that you can cause external things to change when you change your thoughts about them. You change your thoughts and the thing will change externally. The conditions will change. The people in your life will change, etc. Uh, but that's not the one that I, I want to deal with now. I want to give some examples of another meaning of the second statement that there are times when you change the way that you look at things and the things that you're perceiving remain exactly as they were externally. But what happens is that the significance of those things has changed in your mind and that makes all the difference. I'll give you an example. Years ago, long before I was married, I had a girlfriend and I took her to Hope Gardens to see the display of nature's beauty there. As we got out of the car, it started to drizzle. I uttered a mild expletive, very mild, and said to her how disappointed I was that it was raining. And I wanted sunshine and we'd walk and look at the flowers. But my girlfriend looked surprised and she said, but I love the rain. 
And immediately, I have never forgotten that experience. Immediately, I started loving the rain. It, 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 was, it was just such a, a 360 degree turn. I, I, I just, I was amazed. So I started loving the rain and I started thinking how nice it would be to walk hand in hand, walking in the rain and looking at the floor, flora and the fauna of the gardens. Really and truly, I, that turnabout, I just never, I can't forget it. Some of you, to continue in this vein of looking at things um, externally and then seeing it, perceiving it differently from how you normally perceive it. Some of you know the works of Andy Warhol. He's an artist who made us perceive very ordinary things as works of art, like tins of Campbell's soup. Some of you probably have seen Andy War Warhol's work. Just Campbell's soup, and when we look at it in a different way, they become works of art and not just cans of soup for us to open and drink and discard. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the senior curator at the National Gallery, and he told me of his mission to have people look differently at things as well, look differently at craft and at decorative designs, and acknowledge them as worthy of praise, as what we call fine arts. He too wants us to look at these things differently. One book that I did some research in for this talk had this paragraph on the importance of perception. I quote, all the supply there ever was, still is, and ever shall be, for nothing can ever be wasted or lost. There can never be a shortage in supply. But because some people do not see abundance around them and do not enjoy plenty is evidence that they do not understand the law of supply. In their blindness, they say that plenty does not exist. And so far as they can see, they may be right. But when they learn to see with their mind's eye, they will realize differently, unquote. And in fact, when we look around, we see that in fact, plenty exists, abundance exists. But some people close mind and they say, Lord, live in a, in a world of scarcity. Oh, by the way, the economists say that. Econ econ economics is a sense of the study of scarcity. The author of that paragraph that I just read is Raymond Hollowell, and the quote is from the book Working with the Law. That also is the name of the accredited course that started only Thursday, taught by Reverend Anne and Reverend Sonia. And you can still join, not too late, and you can get accredited for attending the course by the Centers of Spiritual Living in Golden, Colorado. Golden, Colorado, that's where the headquarters are. What a beautiful name. The book is very law-centered and is a perfect companion piece to Troward's book, which we mentioned earlier, The Creative Process Individual. That book opens with a paragraph Order is heaven's first law. I want to give you an actual example of the creative process in, in my individual mind. I was driving along early, early one morning, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, and I stopped at a traffic light, and I wondered if I should have stopped, because mine was the only car on the road as far as I could see. Nowadays, you probably should stop for many of the traffic lights are watched, as you know, by cameras. And if you go through, even if there's no other car there on the road, if you go through, you may well get a traffic ticket. Anyway, 
I am glad that I stopped at, at that time because a little poem came to me, the creative process and the individual. I know you want to hear it. It's called Silly Lights. It's three o'clock in the morning. All the traffic has gone to bed. But those silly lights keep changing. Red, green, orange, red. That's it. It just came to me. Creative process. It's not a very profound poem. So that is not the piece that I'm going to end on. You need to end in an elevated frame of mind. So I will end with something more substantial, a treatment on creativity by Reverend Carolyn Cash of Fremont, Fremont, California. The title, I Create My Life with Ease. And I'd like you to internalize it as I read it. The infinite mind of God is all there is, and it is my mind. Awakening to my oneness with the unlimited source, I relax and allow the creative process to unfold with serenity through me. My world reflects the contents of my mind, which I lovingly embrace. Anything I wish to appear, I can choose to change. I am filled with countless new ideas to replace the old. Knowing God only wants the best for me, I move forward with the conviction and faith that all is well in my life. I welcome the abundance of good I see everywhere. I accept the unfolding creation my consciousness brings about. I am happy with all I experience because I know it is the creation of my highest good unfolding as form. I am grateful for God's constant presence, guidance, and support. I allow spirit to flow through me freely, creating my life with ease. I let go and let it be so, and so it is. Namaste.